Hey guys, welcome back to Ben and Brings channel. If you haven't seen us before, we do product reviews, tutorials, and have an online chat feature on our website to get you through your Brew Day 911s. Today's video, we're talking about pressure fermentations. What it is, kind of why it's important, what equipment you need, and is it something you really want to invest in? Let's check it out. Okay guys, so let's talk about what pressure fermentation is. In a typical fermentation, generally you put an airlock on top of your fermenter so that all of that CO2 and gas that's being created can bubble out uh, and keep everything kind of normalized. With a pressure fermentation, you're actually putting some of that or keeping some of that CO2 in the vessel to build up pressure. There's a couple of benefits to doing this. Number one, it suppresses the yeast and their ester formation. For lager yeast, they tend to do very well under pressure fermentations from an ester suppression standpoint. Ale yeast can struggle a little bit, but they also do pretty well. Uh, and there's some benefits that you get more hop utilization or much more hop bitterness out of a pressure fermentation compared to a normal fermentation. The other benefit with doing a pressure fermentation is because you're suppressing the yeast and the esters they're producing, you can ferment at a warmer temperature. And generally yeast are very happy at a warmer temperature. I mean, you can get a lot of yeast to, to ferment at 100 degrees. You're not gonna wanna drink the beer that results from that. So by putting pressure on it, you, pr you suppress the esters, you can raise the temperature up, and the end result is you can ferment faster. You can take a lager that would normally take eight weeks and compress it down into two weeks. And the same thing with ales. You can take a two week ale and you can compress it down into about four or five days. So there is a speed component and a temperature component that you get a benefit from by doing pressure fermentation. Quick disclaimer, when dealing with pressure fermentation, make sure that any vessel that you're using is pressure capable to the pressures you're intending on taking it. The last thing you wanna do is pressurize a glass carboy, which isn't designed for pressure, and have that thing explode uh, and have a dangerous situation. So just a word of caution, please be careful when you're doing pressure fermentation, make sure your relief valves are working and that you're not pressurizing a vessel far beyond what it's capable of doing. Okay, let's talk about some of the equipment that you're gonna need if you wanna start doing pressure fermentation. You can go out in the market right now and they have firmzillas, they've got pressure capable conical fermenters, they've got some really, really cool stuff out there to do pressure fermentation. But if you're not sure if that's something that's gonna work for you, because it may not work for everybody in the beers they wanna make, there is a less expensive option that you can kind of dip your toes in the water. First thing it needs is a keg. So if you're already kegging your beer, you can take one of these and convert it to a pressure fermenting vessel very easy to do. The next thing you're gonna need besides the keg is what's called a spunding valve. And they make a couple different variations of this. This is a very inexpensive one. I think it was maybe $20 uh, through one of our online beer retailers. Um, and it works very, very well. And then something that a lot of people don't use, but I highly recommend is a floating dip tube. Basically in your keg, you already have a dip tube that goes down to the bottom of your keg to make sure you get all the beer. Well, if you're fermenting in this vessel, what's the first thing that's gonna happen when all the yeast settles out? You're gonna get a bunch of beer that could potentially clog your poppets um, or just be kind of nasty as you're trying to draw the beer off and transfer it to a secondary vessel. With this, it kind of solves that problem. One end hooks to the poppet. The other end, which has a stainless steel float on it, keeps the tube near the top of the beer. Not above the level, obviously. So when you start to transfer out, as the beer level drops, so does the float. And it keeps it above all that yeast and trube that is sitting at the bottom of your keg. This is an invaluable item to have if you're gonna do pressure fermentation. And really, you're looking at 10 bucks for the float, you're looking at, what did I say, 20 bucks for the spunding valve, and then if you already have a keg, you're made in the shade, you can do pressure fermentation that easy. Okay, so how does pressure fermentation actually impact the finished result of your, of your fermenting? Well, as I mentioned before, yeast ferment very well at warmer temperatures. You can take an ale yeast, a lager yeast, you can throw it in at 100 degrees, it'll be perfectly happy, it'll ferment out fast, it'll ferment out healthy, and it will produce esters up the wazoo. I mean, it won't be something that you're gonna wanna be drinking. So the reason that temperature control is so important in normal fermentation is it slows down the yeast metabolism and it slows down those ester formations. And so for lagers, which do better at the colder temperatures, that colder temperature really suppresses the lager esters that are being produced. With ales, usually a little bit warmer than lagers, but 
Ales tend to have more of a fruity character, and that's those yeast esters, and you really want those types of flavors. So what pressuring fermentation does, it allows you to raise the temperature of the fermentation, and the pressure helps to suppress the esters that are developed by the yeast. There's a pressure range that you really want to kind of stay within when it comes to pressure fermentations. 15 PSI or one bar is generally recommended for most fermentations. With that, it will allow you to increase your normal fermentations about 10 degrees. So if you're doing a lager at 55, you can do it at 65 with that 15 degrees of pressure. The same rule of thumb, for the most part, applies to ale yeasts, although again, they don't respond as well to the pressure. In addition to the different yeast types, keep in mind that strain, between different strains, some may not do well with that, that pressure fermentation, so really you need to experiment. I've heard of some brewers going up to 30 PSI, two bar, to really suppress things, and the yeast did okay. So generally, you really want to experiment with any house yeast that you use or any yeast that you use consistently to see how it responds to the pressure fermentation. With pressure fermentation, there is something to keep in mind. Um, there are times when that ester suppression works so well that you end up with an ale that is too clean, and that doesn't work with some beer styles. As an example, Belgian styles, right? All about that yeast ester that is so good. If you end up suppressing that, you don't have a Belgian yeast ale anymore. Uh, it doesn't quite taste the same. Hefeweizen is another good example of a, a beer that those those clove and banana flavors, which are those yeast esters, you really want to have a prominence in your beer. If you suppress those, it's not quite the same. So you may be able to balance it with increased pressure or increased temperature, and you really gotta kinda find the happy medium with it. Um, but there's a lot of potential with the, what you can do, especially speeding up a fermentation. Okay guys, so we've talked about a lot of technical things when it comes to pressure fermentation. Let's talk about the pros. First and foremost, if you ferment under pressure, you can actually do a pressure transfer, meaning you don't need to rely on gravity to transfer from your fermenter into another keg uh, or into a secondary fermentation vessel. You could just use the existing pressure that's in there. The other benefit with that is that you've got this lovely fermentation environment that is under CO2 pressure and a CO2 blanket there's no chance for oxidation of your beer as you transfer, which is a big concern for some people. So that's one of the good things you can have with that. The other benefit with the pressure fermentation, as mentioned before, is that the atmospheric temperature or the temperature of your uh, fermenting wort isn't as important because you're suppressing the esters with pressure. So you can ferment at a warmer temperature. And because yeast like a warmer temperature, it will ferment faster. So you can actually fast track your fermentation while suppressing esters at the same time. Another benefit of the pressure fermentation is that you actually save on your usage of CO2. You can use the CO2 that the yeast is generating and use that to carbonate the beer. Whether you transfer that to another keg and carbonate it in there, or you're doing it in your primary fermentation vessel that is pressure capable, keep that in mind, you can carbonate it in there just like a bright tank. Another benefit of doing the pressure fermentation is because you're keeping that CO2 under pressure and you're suppressing the yeast esters, your hop utilization actually comes through better. The volatiles of the hops are not being bubbled out through the CO2 because you're kind of recapturing it and you're minimizing how much is off-gassing. So your hop utilization is better. You may have to reformulate your recipe to compensate for that though. One of the final big benefits that most people don't think of is it actually suppresses infections in your beer. If you think about it, um, you know, we try to maintain and keep everything as clean and sanitary as possible. Wild yeast and bacteria can still get into your beer on a very, very small level. When you're fermenting under pressure, which bacteria and wild yeast typically don't do well in at all, they can't multiply and overpower your beer, giving your brewer's yeast a chance to really take a hold and make that toxic environment for this other stuff to not be able to take a foothold. Okay, so we've covered quite a bit when it comes to the pressure fermentation. And you may be thinking that, why isn't everybody doing this? Why isn't this just kind of a standard thing? There are actually quite a few drawbacks to doing pressure fermentation that you need to be aware of before you really venture into this. So first and foremost, obviously, there's an extra equipment investment. Um, the way that I showed you with the keg, you can do it with minimal investment, but there is still additional equipment processes that you need to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind too is that not all yeasts do well under pressure. Um, lager yeast tend to do better than ale yeast, although both can certainly do it, but even between specific lager yeast or specific ale yeast, some don't respond well to pressure and either may stall a fermentation uh, or just not have a healthy fermentation at all. So it really requires experimentation on your part to determine with your current brewing system and setup, 
Will this yeast be happy under pressure? The other thing to keep in mind is that not all styles lend themselves to pressure fermentation. Uh, yeast esters are a very important part of ales uh, and specific styles like Belgian beers, where they have that nice yeast ester, or even Hefeweizens, where you have that banana and clove that comes through. If you put those yeast under pressure and try to do a wit beer or a, a German wheat beer, they're gonna come through so clean, there won't be that character, so it doesn't always lend itself to that. A lot of you hop heads out there love dry hop your beers. Keep in mind with pressure fermentation, that's a bit more tricky. Not impossible, but requires additional equipment as well. If you try to take a pressure fermentation vessel, you release the pressure on it, you throw hops in there, you're gonna have a beer volcano because you've got a beer that's under pressure, you've suddenly released the pressure, and now you're introducing all these wonderful nucleation points for it to just completely come out of solution. So there's ways to do it under pressure, uh, which isn't what we're talking about today, but it kind of goes back to that additional equipment and you need to be cautious and aware. The other thing to keep in mind with pressure fermentation is it does put the yeast under some stress. So it's important to make sure that your yeast are very, very healthy. Yeast starters are going to be your friend when you're pressure fermenting. Not really something you can direct pitch into a batch of beer if you're putting it under pressure. Speaking of yeast, once you pressure ferment with a particular uh, bunch of yeast, they have now become accustomed to that environment, the shape of your vessel, the fact that they're under pressure. And if you try to repitch them in a non-pressurized environment, they may not adapt well. You may get all sorts of weird fermentation or excessive off flavors because they've adapted to one environment and suddenly you've thrust them into something completely different. So repitching, for those of you that do that, may not be possible if you're doing pressure to non-pressure. And finally, kind of the biggest uh, as to why you can't do every single beer style with it. Uh, and we mentioned it before, but your ales may come out too clean. Even if it's not a Belgian, even if it's not a Hefeweizen, you just may be doing a regular pale ale and it comes out so clean that it has a lager-like quality and, and doesn't quite balance. You don't get that nice fruitiness that is expected of an ale. So be cautious and experiment with pressure fermentation before you really do everything that you make under pressure. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching our pressure fermentation video. If you feel like it brought you value, please hit that like and subscribe button. It really means a lot to us and helps to support our channel. Also, if you haven't already, check out our new podcast, the Hot Break Craft Beer Cast, on all of your favorite podcast providers. Thank you so much, my friends. We'll catch you later.